Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Morgan. I'm Lyndon Chubin. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs. And we're delighted to present today's lecture on the making of The Little Prince by our curator, Philip Palmer. The exhibition, The Little Prince Taking Flight, is on view through February 5th of 2023 and is a delight if you already haven't seen it. Uh, we have many related programs, including film screenings, uh, Family First Saturday exhibition tours and story time, and a concert of French works composed the same period as the publication of The Little Prince. The Little Prince Taking Flight is made possible by Catherine J. Rayner. For information on all of our exhibitions, programs, and concerts this fall season, please visit our website, and I encourage those of you who are not already members to support our activities throughout the year. Philip S. Palmer is the Robert H. Taylor Curator and Department Head of Literary and Historical Manuscripts. He received his PhD in Early Modern English Literature in 2013, from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and from 2014 to 16, he held a Council on Library and Information Resources postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA's Clark Library. He continued at the Clark for three years as head of research services before starting at the Morgan in 2019. Philip is trained as a scholar of early modern English literature and book history, but his interests are wide ranging and at the Morgan have encompassed work on Isaac Newton, Charles Dickens, and Oscar Wilde, to name a few. He has curated exhibitions on Woody Guthrie, James Joyce, and now The Little Prince. Please join me in welcoming Philip Palmer and The Making of The Little Prince. Thank you, Lyndon, for that introduction, and welcome everyone to the Morgan. Um, if you haven't already seen the exhibition, I encourage you to take a look after the talk today, and it is open through February 5th. Okay, let me go ahead and go to my title slide there, okay. Near the end of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry's Le Petit Prince, after the prince hears the fox's wisdom, he visits with several human beings on earth. He observes their behavior and professional activities with much interest including the work of the railway switchman and a store clerk selling thirst-quenching pills. These parts may read somewhat oddly in that they are sandwiched between the iconic scenes with the fox beforehand and the prince and pilot's search for the desert well afterward. In their curious, lightly satirical perspective on human endeavor, these scenes echo the format of the prince's journey to the other planets. The prince encounters a strange grown-up who, though acting according to their nature and profession, emerges from the text as patently ridiculous, absurd in their strivings and hang-ups. This was even more evident in the early draft of The Little Prince, which is preserved at the Morgan. There we encounter several scenes, all cut from the final publication, that document the prince's further travels among grown-up earthlings with his observations of their eccentricities and obsessions. Take, for example, this scene set at a store selling rather unusual devices, and I'm going to read uh, this scene right now. At the store, here's a customer. Hello, what do you have there? Why, it's a very expensive instrument. When you turn the handle, it makes the sound of a small earthquake. Well, what is that for? To give pleasure to whoever enjoys earthquakes. I don't. Well, well, if you don't enjoy earthquakes, I won't be able to sell my instrument. Industry and commerce will be paralyzed. Here's a book on marketing. After you've studied it carefully, you'll like earthquakes and you'll buy my instrument. Read it quickly. It's full of slogans that are easy to remember. So the scene is, of course, to me at least, quite funny and its author's satirical take on the consumer culture of the modern world, particularly evident in New York City where saint Exupéry wrote The Little Prince, remains familiar today. We also see in this passage saint Exupéry's love of gadgets a passion activated in part by his aviation career, an experience repairing the fairly primitive aircraft of, his, of the era. His biographer, Stacy Schiff, offers an account of saint Exupéry's enthusiasm for daydreaming of such devices. And I quote, he fiddled with a variety of inventions, mostly on paper. 
He envisioned an early kind of pay-per-view television. He described the workings of photoelectric cells. He laid out the idea of a genetic code. At the end of 1934, he filed the first of his 10 patents for a blind landing device operated by radio waves. After completing Le Petit Prince, when he returned to North Africa, Saint-Exupéry brought with him some beloved American gadgets. He was particularly fond of his electric razor that he bought in New York City. The passage in question, however, contains a gadget uh, that the prince, and presumably Saint-Exupéry, did not care for, a machine that mimics the sound of subterranean tremors, intended to give pleasure to whoever enjoys earthquakes. And here is a drawing of that device not put into the final book, and this is from a private collection. For the prince, definitively not a fan of earthquakes, a better gadget would be, quote, an instrument that will make the moon rise, which he asks the shopkeeper to sell. This bold request angers the merchant. I'm gonna read a little bit more from the scene. There's no such thing, that's disruptive. You're a revolutionary, you must like my instrument. If you don't like what's available to you, you'll never be happy. If you like what is available to you, you will be happy. And what's more, you'll be a free citizen. How so? You won't be free to buy until you want what's available. Otherwise, you create chaos. Now, go read your marketing lesson. We learn elsewhere in the draft manuscript that the prince is partial to the moon, whose tidal influence on his asteroid's small inland sea allows him to catch shrimp. In other words, despite the fantastical request, the prince's gadget turns out to be more practical, of more use to the prince than the earthquake sound machine and all of its attendant marketing slogans. It echoes a sentiment we encounter elsewhere when the prince speaks with a star-counting businessman during his travels and concludes, quote, it is of some use to my volcanoes, and it is of some use to my flower that I own them, but you are of no use to the stars. Saint-Exupéry's satirical take on the businessman, of course, echoes sentiment from that deleted gadget shop scene I just read, with both offering humorous send-ups of corporate discourse. And here are two different drawings of the businessman, by the way, from the Morgan's collection. The brief case study of a lost Little Prince scene is just one example of what we can learn from the draft manuscript and original drawings for the book, which are preserved in the Morgan's Department of Literary and Historical Manuscripts, which I run. Just before leaving the United States in 1943 to join Allied forces in North Africa, Saint-Exupéry gave the New York City journalist Sylvia Hamilton, his friend and lover, a parting gift his Zeiss icon camera, and a draft manuscript of The Little Prince, along with original artwork. It was at Hamilton's New York apartment that Saint-Exupéry composed much of the story, which was written for young readers, but of course has been cherished by both children and adults alike. You can see in this photograph, uh, the blonde-haired doll, actually, at Sylvia Hamilton's apartment that Saint-Exupéry based the prince's blonde hair upon. And here, in a letter to Sylvia Hamilton, Antoine sends his greetings to her black poodle shown at the bottom, which was the model for the sheep in The Little Prince. The draft manuscript and original artwork for the book would remain with Sylvia Hamilton for another 25 years until in 1968 she sold it to the Morgan. Before that acquisition, the Morgan's director sought the support of the children's literature collector Elizabeth Ball, shown here photographed as a young person. Surprisingly, Ball had actually not heard of The Little Prince but she solicited her friend, a children's librarian, for an opinion about the book. The verdict? Well, the library could not keep it on the shelves. It was so popular. The rest is history. Elizabeth Ball helped the Morgan acquire the manuscript in 1968, and it has been here ever since. It would join other important manuscripts of children's literature in the LHMS department, including a dozen of Beatrix Potter's picture letters, one shown on the left, and an early illustrated manuscript of Charles Perrault's Mother Goose Tales on the right. Both digitized on our website, by the way. Our current exhibition, The Little Prince Taking Flight, is an intimately scaled presentation of highlights from, from Saint-Exupéry's original draft manuscript and the artwork for Petit Prince. It explores this theme of flight in both figurative and physical dimensions, beginning with the extraordinary career of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry as a writer, aviator, artist, and continuing into the story of the book itself with the pilot's crash landing in the desert where he would soon meet that odd little traveler from asteroid B612. The show is also a story of the imagination. The draft manuscript and drawings document Saint-Exupéry's creative process and encourage us to ask 
how is a great book made? The show reveals key differences between the manuscript and published text, the original watercolors, and the final illustrations. Now, many of the 26 original drawings that we have on view in the gallery were recently in Paris at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs for their blockbuster exhibition on Petit Prince, and you can see some installation shots here. This was curated by Anne Monnier, curator of toys at the museum, as well as Alban Cerissier, a recognized expert on Saint-Exupéry. And there were significant loans from the estates of both Antoine and Consuelo, his wife, as well as from the Morgan Library. Actually, the, these works went to the, from the Morgan to France for the first time ever, and there was quite a bit of press about it. I hope some of you had a chance to see that show in Paris, and there is a catalog if you're interested in learning more. Our exhibition, of course, is much smaller in size, but I think that the intimate setting of the Thaw Gallery, the cube, actually matches quite well with the miniature scale of asteroid B612. So we hope you take the advantage to really have an intimate experience with these drawings uh, after the talk. One thing the show will do is invite you to compare the original art watercolors with the finished illustrations. The Little Prince is one of those books for which text and image are perfectly balanced, with that balance being carefully crafted and, made, and perfected by the author illustrator. Saint Exupéry kept a close eye on the book's design and maintained full artistic license to fulfill his vision. In a letter to his editor in 1943, he explicitly spells out the scope of his authority over the book's design. And I quote, I want to make it clear that where any decisions are to be made, it is I who will decide on A, the placement of illustrations, B, their relative dimensions, C, whether or not they should be in full color, and D, how the captions should read. And we see Saint-Exupéry's hand every step of the way, from the early manuscript, draft, and preparatory artwork at the Morgan, to typescripts, proofs, and finished watercolor illustrations in other collections. So Saint-Exupéry started working on Petit Prince in early summer 1942, completing the book in mid-October. Publication did not happen until April 1943, with some trouble with the color illustrations creating that delay. It was written in three different locations, his Central Park South apartment, the Park Avenue apartment of Sylvia Hamilton, who I mentioned earlier, and the Long Island home that both Consuelo and Antoine rented, known as Bevan House. The manuscript held by the Morgan is often described as the original manuscript. And in fact, lots of manuscripts in our collection are described uh, loosely, I would say, uh, using this phrase. And I do think that original can be a very misleading term. In many cases, the absolute first draft of a text is simply just no longer extant today. The accidents of time, in addition to shifting ideas of cultural value, have ensured that, especially for older manuscripts, like from Shakespeare's era, for instance. In fact, what we often see is something like the earliest surviving draft of a text. This is the case with the manuscript of Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray, also in our collection, and also in some ways true of the Petit Prince manuscript here. But there's also an important partially censored typescript of Dorian Gray, just as there are typescripts and proofs of Petit Prince. In other words, while it's tempting to fall into this binary of original manuscript and finished publication of manuscript and print, it is much more useful to think of a continuum of overlapping creative stages. Extant drawings allow us to document the visual genesis of the book's illustrations, which in some cases underwent more significant alteration than the text itself. And I'll say that the text in the manuscript is remarkably close to the final text. It does have a number of scenes and bits of dialogue that get deleted, and of course revisions here and there, but it's pretty close to the final. The French scholar of Saint-Exupéry and Petit Prince, Alban Cerissier, notes how the simplicity of the illustrations is deceiving and conceals in some ways the author's vast efforts to perfect his illustrations for the book. He views this process in what I think is a quite beautiful turn of phrase as Saint-Exupéry's, quote, search for an emotion. And indeed, the many extant versions of his images demonstrate their creative range and visual evolution. And I just want to show you a few slides here to show you all the different stages that we know about in the text from a very early manuscript draft of the first page of the book on the left, to our first page of the draft at the Morgan on the right, some early typescripts with handwritten annotations of those first few pages as well. And then this is an example of uh, an early watercolor in the Morgan's collection and then the finished watercolor on the right. And then two examples of finished watercolors that have no corollary in the Morgan's collection. 
With this overview in mind, I would like now to turn to the story itself and look more closely at some of the drawings and manuscript leaves from the exhibition, particularly how they show Saint-Exupéry's efforts to refine, revise, and perfect his literary masterpiece. We are going to encounter some unfamiliar characters, some lost scenes, and several odd scraps of dialogue. We will learn of the little prince's vegetable garden, and we will see how one of the world's great author illustrators transformed his early watercolors into the beloved drawings that have captivated millions of readers around the world. One of the first objects in the show is a drawing that Santa Exuberi chose not to include in the final version of the book, one showing the pilot soon after his plane crash, crash lands in the desert. This event is, of course, the catalyst for the pilot meeting the little prince and ultimately becomes the story the narrator tells and writes down many years later. I use this drawing of the pilot to introduce the author, a man who at times seems nearly as famous an aviator as an artist. A few recently acquired photographs by the Morgan help tell the story of the writer pilot. Um, and these are on view in the gallery. You can see these two photographs from the 1920s of clouds above Paris. Uh, Saint-Exupéry was piloting this aircraft and one of his uh, colleagues in the, in the plane took the photos. He would make a name for himself, Saint-Exupéry, uh, flying early airmail routes in Africa and South America. Here you can see him in Buenos Aires in 1930. And it was his experience in Argentina that would inspire one of his first great literary works, Vol de Nuit, or Night Flight, published in 1931. In the exhibition, I've included a particularly compelling passage from this book to illustrate how beautifully Saint-Exupéry writes about flight and aviation, even when describing tragic circumstances. Now, this is a passage that describes the character Fabian, a pilot emerging from these storm clouds um, to apparent safety only to realize that the fuel is running out in his plane and he is certainly doomed. So I'm going to read the passage. I'm daft, thought Fabian, to be smiling. We're lost. And yet, at last a myriad dark arms had let him go. Those bonds of his were loosed, as of a prisoner whom they let walk a while in liberty amongst the flowers. Too beautiful, he thought. Amid the far-flung treasure of the stars, he roved in a world where no life was, no faintest breath of life, save his and his companions. Like plunderers of fabled cities they seemed, immured in treasure vaults whence there is no escape. Amongst these frozen jewels they were wandering, rich beyond all dreams, but doomed. Beautiful, beautiful writing in the translation of Stuart Gilbert. Saint Exupéry survived several plane crashes during his career. Some of, which, some of which left him in significant chronic pain. Other than his mysterious disappearance over the Mediterranean in 1944, still the subject of debate about what exactly happened, his most famous plane crash occurred in December 1935, when he and his navigator crashed into the Libyan desert. They were stranded with only a little coffee to drink, but enough to stave off dehydration until their fortuitous rescue by a Bedouin caravan four days later. The episode would directly inspire the encounter between the pilot and Prince in the book. And this is a photo of the plane that crash landed before, before it crash landed. One of the main differences between the early version of the book and the final publication is a significant reduction in the details provided about this pilot narrator. The early watercolors depict the pilot three times, while the final book does not show him at all. The pilot's life story is more closely autobiographical as well in the draft manuscript, whereas the pilot becomes a bit more generic in the finished book. For instance, in the manuscript, the narrator tells us quite a bit more. Quote, I learned to pilot airplanes. I established airline routes. I've flown just about everywhere. I've also written books and gone to war. It has been well established that one of the key interpretations of the book is that both the pilot and the prince represent different facets of, Saint, of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, that his essence infuses both characters. And yet, despite the many autobiographical readings encouraged by the little prince, Saint-Exupéry's decision to minimize the pilot's specificity in some ways helps preserve the timeless fairy tale like qualities of the story. The drawings themselves, despite being cut from the book, are actually quite interesting. Here we can see the first of the pilot alone in the desert with his plane wrecked in the background. And you can see two different versions of this drawing here. Uh, his eyes seem to be closed, his arms wrapped tightly around his body, yet his legs are crossed in what seems to be a somewhat relaxed manner. Much like the drawings of the little prince in the desert when he first arrives on earth, 
Here we see the pilot completely alone with the forbidding landscape dominating the composition and creating an endless desolate horizon. Arguably the more interesting drawings are these, which adopt a fairly experimental perspective to show the outstretched hand of the pilot bearing his trusty hammer, arguing with a clearly consternated little prince before him. This scene takes place just after the pilot meets the prince for the first time. He's preoccupied with repairing his aircraft while the little prince just wants to talk about his rose. The first of the two drawings is a bit more subdued with the prince holding his hands at his side, appearing to be in mid stride. In the second drawing though, we can see the little prince with his hands on his hips in a stance that seems more impatient and frustrated than in the first drawing. His presence seems more immediate. His mouth appears open and engaged in dialogue with the pilot. There is a preparatory sketch for this watercolor in a private collection shown here, depicting the prince in a very similar posture, um, as well as the, the hand with the hammer. And you can see that Saint Exupery seemed to have some, some trouble in drawing that hammer in the hand uh, with the placement of the hammer. Certainly that first person perspective we see in these drawings is fairly unusual when we look at the other drawings in the book. And that is perhaps one reason why Saint Exupery left it out of the final version. The Little Prince is a book of stories within stories, containing several points that we might identify as the beginning of the narrative. We have the frame of the tale itself, the pilot's recollections of his encounter with the prince many years ago. We have the prince's account of his own travels from asteroid B612 to various planets and finally to Earth. In the manuscript, we even see the pilot narrator telling a story about the little prince on Earth, or, I'm sorry, on his asteroid, basically saying that once upon a time there was a little prince who lived on a planet and he was bored. That's the beginning of that story. But at the very beginning of the book, we have a story of childhood, of the aviator as a boy drawing some pictures that grown-ups just don't understand. We have to remember the importance of childhood in The Little Prince. The pilot sees his own inner child in the figure of the prince, and both characters embody the personality of Saint-Exupéry, who had many formative influences as a child, including the artistic predilections of his mother, an accomplished watercolorist, as well as the tragic deaths of his father when Antoine was four, and his brother Francois when Antoine was 17. This is the earliest point in the story's chronology and also the actual opening of the book, which begins, once when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book. But this was not always how the book began. Here we see a variant of this page that starts quite differently with the opening line, I don't know how to draw. Je ne sais pas désigner. If the published version of the opening recalls the past through nostalgic reminiscences about art drawing and the stirring of a child's imagination, this early version places us directly in the present with a statement from the narrator on his failure to express the imagination through art. And what follows is a rather funny example, a memory of an early drawing of a boat that the narrator showed his friend. The drawing was not a success, as his friend thought it resembled a potato. And we may have a potato up here as well. I'm not sure <laughs> what exactly that is. We then see the familiar drawing number one and drawing number two, the famous boa constrictor swallowing the elephant. And just like the grown-ups in the final version of the book, the narrator's friend asks if he has drawn a hat. Lastly, in the final bit of text on this variant page, we hear of some trouble with the narrator's drawing of an airplane. And I quote, I wanted to draw an airplane one day, and my friend asked me what it was. So I wrote on it, airplane, and I didn't talk about my drawings anymore. The draft manuscript of the Morgan does not mention these boat or airplane drawings, and in fact, is fairly close in form to the final version of the text. One difference is that we also see the deflationary effect of boa digestion here in the middle, which is not shown in the final book. And on another sheet of sketches at the Morgan, we see those three drawings repeated yet again. Soon after remembering his early drawings, the narrator hears the prince's unforgettable command, Désignez-moi un mouton, draw me a sheep. One of the most famous revisions to the manuscript is Saint-Exupéry's addition of s'il vous plaît to the command, which you can see here. This sheet from the draft manuscript shows the narrator's three failed sheep drawings, each rejected by the prince in turn for being sick, a ram, or too old. We can see other versions of these drawings in the typescripts held at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and Harry, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas. Those are here. 
The book turns next to the prince's backstory, showing him at work and at leisure on his tiny planet, asteroid B612. But it didn't always have that name, and the story of its discovery changed from the manuscript to the printed book. Asteroid B612, the little prince's home planet, is described as, quote, scarcely any larger than a house. In the published book, the asteroid had been identified by a Turkish astronomer in 1909. And you can see the, the published version of this page on the right. But the astronomer had not been taken seriously because of his, quote, Turkish costume, only convincing the scientific community of his discovery when he eventually adopts European garb. In the manuscript, and we can see this on the left, St. Exupery first made the astronomer Dutch, but then revised his nationality and added a fez to the figure. And you can see the, uh, if I can get my pointer working here somewhere. Well, it's over there uh, on, his, on his head. You can see it. <clears throat> Moreover, instead of changing the Turkish astronomer's clothing, St. Exupery added another astronomer, a person boring enough to be believed, as the manuscript says, who observed the asteroid for a second time in 1919, calling it ACB 316, so we have the asteroid changing names. This fascinating page, uh, moving on to the, another, another deleted page, um, shows the pilot starting the tale of the little prince, and I mentioned this briefly earlier. Once upon a time, there was a little prince who lived on too small a planet and became extremely bored. Each day, the little prince sweeps his planet, the dust flying off of the planet and becoming stars in the sky, and you can see that image on the left. We also have a little prince with only three strands of hair on his head, so his, his hairstyle changes as well um, as St. Exupery is working on these drawings. He also bathes in the sea, which he calls his tub. He frets over the volcanoes, and he tends a vegetable garden with radishes, tomatoes, potatoes, and beans. But the scene is not perfect, for, quote, within his seed packet, there were some baobab seeds. One of the little prince's daily tasks is to remove baobabs, an invasive species of tree growing on his planet. The published book illustrates this scene with images of the prince at work and of a, quote, lazy man's overgrown planet, which you can see here. But as is evident in these preliminary drawings, St. Exupery worked through several approaches to illustrating these invasive plants. Here you see two drawings from the Morgan's collection, both depicting a single baobab tree and the little prince with a shovel. These illustrations, the one on the left we've already seen from the Morgan and the one on the right from the Ransom Center, also shows the single tree with the little prince variously equipped with a bow tie or scarf, shovel, or pickaxe. Thus we see Saint Exupery work, worked hard to perfect this illustration. And in the story, the narrator actually draws attention to the process of creating the baobab drawing, which he expects readers will regard as the best illustration in the book. As the narrator writes, the success of the drawing can be attributed to, quote, the inspiring force of urgent necessity, that is, the importance of spreading word about the dangerously invasive baobabs through text and image alike. The narrator even adopts what he calls, quote, the tone of a moralist when warning children of these baobabs. We can see many important differences between the final version of the drawing and the earlier sketches. So we have three trees, not one. The perspective is slightly different with the viewer below the planet and Prince, and instead of the Prince facing the Baobabs with his shovel or pickaxe, we see instead the overrun planet of what St. Exubery calls in the caption a lazy man. Certainly the final drawing has a threatening quality to it, but in my humble opinion, the earlier watercolors are more frightening. There we are not faced with the hypothetical lazy man's planet with its potential Baobab problem, but rather the little Prince immediately endangered by their presence on asteroid B612. The Baobab in this drawing is particularly menacing. It is, it is composed more of roots than canopy, and the roots have a death grip on the planet, recalling the contours of a human hand under tension. But this hand is uncanny and monstrous, with its seven fingers overstretching the fragile arc of the planet beneath. As we read in the book, quote, if the planet is too small, they split it in pieces. There is a famous reading of the Baobabs that figures their malignant influence as the rise of fascism in Europe. And this reading is certainly compelling given the historical context in which Saint-Exupery wrote Le Petit Prince during the Second World War. Thinking again about that quote from Alban Cerisier that Saint-Exupery was in search of emotion through his sketches. We move from fear in the Baobab drawing to sadness in this one. 
The planet's small scale allows the prince, with only a minor adjustment of his chair, to, quote, see the day end and the twilight falling whenever he wishes. This scene expresses a deeply melancholic sense of longing, amplified in a personal way for Saint-Exupéry through his visual reference to a yellowish green chair that the prince is sitting on, which was similar to one he had as a boy. Despite the miracle of catching the sunset repeatedly over and over again, the prince ultimately regards the pastime as a, quote, monotonous game. And here you can see the various sunset drawings that exist, the one on the left of the Morgan, the one on the right, a finished watercolor from a private collection. And you can see the final black and white illustration with the text inside of the asteroid's orb. It is at this point in the story that the little prince journeys away from his planet, helped along the way by a flock of birds as depicted in the book's frontispiece and blown up on the back wall of the gallery, along with the caption, I believe that for his escape, he took advantage of the migration of a flock of wild birds. The little prince embarks on an interstellar journey and visits six planets. A king inhabits the first, which was, quote, crammed and obstructed by his magnificent ermine robe. This manuscript page, with his costume, with his costume much curtailed, presents a more compact scene than the final book. After the king orders his visitor to stay, the prince says, I'm bored here, I'm leaving anyway but not wanting to be, quote, the most disobeyed king in the universe, the ruler orders the prince to leave. Through this absurd situation, Saint-Exupéry really captures, I think, a sense of the arbitrary logic of authority, and certainly he did not always have the greatest opinion of authority figures in his own life. This alternate watercolor held in the collection of Air France shows a different version of the king, closer to the final illustration than ours. And I have to say, I'm very impressed that Air France has its own collection of rare material. I think that's really cool. <laughs> I mentioned the businessman earlier in my talk, but it's worth noting the various forms he takes in Saint-Exupéry's sketches for the Little Prince. You can see two of them here, both at the Morgan, with the one on the left in view in our gallery. Here is the final illustration as published in 1943 on the left. We can see that in both images, the businessman sits at a desk and gestures toward a book or paper, presumably his accounting of the stars. One of my favorite drawings from this part of the story is the butterfly catcher, a character that does not appear in the final version of the book. With its caterpillars and flower protecting device, the scene recalls some of the prince's descriptions of his rose and even visually echoes the landscape of asteroid B612. Elsewhere, the prince mentions butterfly collecting in a positive light as a hobby that new friends might talk about. And I, I really just love the details here, the little caterpillar on the flower at the bottom right here. Um, the, the device really recalls Saint-Exupéry's interest in gadgetry in interesting ways. Uh, it's a great drawing. After the prince travels and sees the six different planets inhabited by six ridiculous larger-than-life figures, we come to the seventh planet, Earth. And here we see a noticeable difference. Instead of immediately meeting people, the little prince arrives in a barren desert populated only with bones and cacti. We know from elsewhere in the book that Earth contains millions and millions of the kinds of people the little prince encountered on the previous planets, countless businessmen, kings, and the like. But here we see the prince alone once again, shouting into the void and hearing in response only his echo. He does not encounter people, only their disembodied traces. I want to spend a little time with the echo scene and its associated drawings, which I, I find to be some of the most moving illustrations from the book. The final image, which you can see here, does not actually illustrate the echo scene according to the caption, but rather illustrates the desert's dry and pointed landscape. We get a sense for the vast wilderness surrounding the prince, who appears tiny on a vertiginous mountaintop with his back to the viewer. Two early watercolors, neither used in the published book, depict very different formulations of this scene. In all three, we see the prince looking away from the viewer, gazing deep into the forbidding and inhospitable landscape. The watercolor on the left depicts the prince perched on a treacherous ledge overlooking a narrow canyon with a star in the sky. The watercolor on the right instead shows the prince astride an incline, watching the yellow sun blaze high above the beautiful desert horizon with its hues of green and pink. And I, this is just one of my favorite drawings in, in the show and in the collection. This watercolor invokes another drawing we saw earlier, namely the sunset. 
In both cases, the prints looks away from the viewer toward the sun, and both drawings create feelings of longing and melancholy. Here is one more drawing from the Morgan's collection depicting an even more different version of the scene and a very different conception of the Little Prince's outfit. It's at this point in the book when the Little Prince comes across a garden, all abloom with roses, as Saint-Exupéry writes. And at this point, the Prince has a moment of crisis. He thought that his rose on asteroid B612 was unique, but, quote, here were 5,000 of them, all alike, in one single garden. The draft presents the scene slightly differently. The prince finds the garden on a hilltop, and I quote, a mountain is always arrogant, reads the manuscript, but a hill is welcoming and cheerful, always laden with pretty things. This optimistic language makes the prince's realization about the ubiquity of roses even more disheartening. All he can do is lie down on the grass and weep, and that is the image we see here on the screen. You can see both a more finished watercolor uh, here as well as a preliminary sketch, both at the Morgan, and we actually know that the Swiss writer Denis de Rougemont uh, was the model for the prince lying on his belly on the ground in that manner. It is shortly after the scene when the little prince meets a fox, inspired by the long-eared fennec foxes encountered in North Africa. This is, of course, a major turning point in the book, as the prince learns about the importance of taming, that the time we spend on friends and loved ones, the bonds we form with them, make those people special to us, even if there are thousands of roses that all look alike. There is actually no fox drawing among the original watercolors for the little prince, but Saint-Exupéry made this sketch for his friend Elizabeth Raynal, who do donated it to the Morgan in the early 1990s. And Elizabeth Raynal was one of his only friends who spoke French in New York. She also helped him buy uh, paper and brushes and paint from a local dime store. And her husband was one of the publishers that brought out the little prince in 1943. The prince also learns the book's central piece of wisdom, that the essential is invisible to the eye, a phrase that appears in several different versions in the draft manuscript. On the page currently displayed in the gallery, the Little Prince actually delivers the line, what is essential is always invisible. And he does so before he meets the fox. And he actually delivers this line to the roses in the rose garden. The fox's secret philosophy animates several late passages of the book. The desert is beautiful because, quote, somewhere it hides a well. And the pilot carrying the sleeping prince thinks, quote, what I see here is nothing but a shell. What is most important is invisible. The prince's fragility becomes more noticeable as he approaches his one year anniversary on earth. And this brings us close to the end of the book and the prince's conversation with the snake. The drawing of the little prince on the wall at left is one of my personal favorites in the collection. I have a lot of favorite drawings in this collection. At right, you can see the finished watercolor for the illustration, recently shown at that exhibition in Paris I mentioned. I really love the creative context the drawing on the left gives us. The graphite sketch of the prince above the watercolor, the cigarette burn in the middle of the sheet, the hint of yellow at bottom right marking the snake's presence. It's easy to imagine Saint-Exupéry burning the midnight oil while laboring over his book with plentiful coffee and cigarettes to keep him going. And other, other sheets have coffee stains on them. We know that Saint-Exupéry would write late into the night and then call his friends, waking them up to read parts of the draft. And he was really annoying his friends in France by doing that. So he started calling friends in California who happened to still be awake. That was, that was a little better. <clears throat> the suggestive presence of the snake in this drawing colored similar, similarly to the prince's scarf, reminds us of the melancholy scene this depicts. They speak about an appointed, an appointed time and place of the prince's departure. And that night, after, quote, a flash of yellow close to his ankle, the prince fell as gently as a tree falls and left earth behind. I want to close today's lecture with the exhibition's signature image, the drawing of the little prince soaring high above the earth. Much like the last drawing we looked at, with the prince sitting on the wall, we have an object with a fascinating physical history. And I don't think you'll be able to make it out in this image, you certainly can in the gallery, but when viewing the drawing under raking light, light supplied from the sides to show the contours of the object, it's quite easy to see that Saint-Exupéry decided to discard this drawing, balling it up and presumably tossing it into the garbage. 
only for it to be rescued by someone, clearly, and we're not sure who. I think this page should remind us of the ephemerality of cultural expression on paper, of the vagaries of time and circumstance that have consigned so many drafts and first thoughts to oblivion. Certainly, there are other sheets that Saint Exupery destroyed more thoroughly that we cannot see, that we were not meant to see. But obviously, there was an intervention somewhere along the way with this drawing, and I think we're all fortunate we can see its lovely form today. And though the image does not appear to illustrate any obvious scene from the book, perhaps the prince's arrival on Earth, it has a visual affinity with several other drawings by the author. We have this one, also from the Morgan, of a top hat wearing winged figure flying over the earth. And we have these drawings, all part of inscriptions Saint Exupery added to books given to friends, as well as these others as well. And this is like all of a sudden not working. There we go. <clears throat> Each of these drawings depicts a little prince-like figure soaring above a planet below. Sometimes he has wings, sometimes not. In some drawings, he appears on a cloud, and in others, he is flying freely. There are some interesting details in these drawings. Two of them depict a second cloud inhabited by a horned devil with the words Messerschmitt 109, an allusion to a German fighter plane used during the Second World War. And the prince's cloud has the name of a French fighter plane, the Block 174. On the surface of Earth, seen from a bird's eye view in these drawings, we see trees and houses, but also sheep and roses, and even a horse in one of the drawings. And I think the drawings of the sheep and rose are really key to understanding these images. Where exactly is this figure flying? Does he soar above the Earth? Or do these drawings show him flying above asteroid B612? Or perhaps a better question is, did the two collapse into one another? Are they one and the same in some ways? Read this way, the prince's departure from his asteroid is actually a homecoming. He may leave his rose behind, but he gains a profound understanding of his relationship with her while he visits Earth. He has to leave home to get back home. Distance offers perspective, in other words, and I think that's what these drawings are doing, visually symbolizing the perspective gained by distance, whether the distance of physical space, elapsed time, or lapsed relationships. In a passage deleted from the final version of the book, the pilot narrator offers a meta commentary on his drawings and their role in his life. I'm gonna read this passage out. Because I'm kind hearted, I've never told the grown ups that I'm not from their world. I've hidden from them the fact that I've always been five or six years old at heart, and therefore I have hidden my drawings from them. But I love to show them to my friends. These drawings are my memories. For the narrator, art is what bridges distance and preserves the spirit of friends long gone. Creative expression keeps the inner child within each of us alive. And even though we live on a planet of serious grown-ups, art can fashion new worlds within our own. Thank you.